Understanding what jurors will do with your evidence, how they're responding to your case, what's working, what's failing, is essential. What's really exciting now is if you put your case online and you present it in a way that jurors are seeing the case but boiled down, and you know what 400 people think of your case, there's not much mystery left. You know if your client's credible. You know if the evidence is working. You know how likely you are to win. You know that if you ask for a certain amount of money, it works better than if you go too high or too low. You can test those things. And so what we view it as is, look, good lawyers are great with good information, right? So the more they know, the more they can make informed decisions. My name is John Campbell. I'm a co-founder of Campbell Law. We are trial lawyers and we also do big data. I've been practicing law 16 years. If you'd asked me a few years before I became a lawyer, if I was gonna be a lawyer, I would have told you no, I think. You know, my background was as a high school teacher. I taught English and Spanish in the inner city. And I started seeing that kids were getting taken advantage of by law enforcement and all sorts of things. It's got me thinking about whether I wanted to sort of continue to operate in that system or whether there was something else I could do. My wife, who was also a school teacher, was having very similar thoughts. We came home and we don't even remember who said it first, but we both said, you know, I think I'd like to go to law school. We hadn't talked about it. So then we had to figure out, well, how do you do that? So what we did was we moved to St. Louis. We taught high school during the day and we went to law school at St. Louis University at night. The goal originally was maybe we'll do educational law. Uh, maybe we'll do, you know, something that represents what we were seeing happening in the inner city. And we kind of come full circle because now our firm uh, when we're working on our own cases, does excessive force cases primarily, suing police officers, uh, enforcing civil rights. And so that's what we're passionate about. So big data in 2023 in law is essential to understanding the case you have. So we do a lot of work with firms all over the country studying their cases. And what does that mean to study a case? Well, we present the plaintiff and defense case, but instead of doing that in a focus group, we present it to hundreds or sometimes even thousands of jurors online. That gives us the power to do statistical analysis, to manipulate things in and out of the case, which is kind of cool. So if you're wondering, well, if this piece of evidence comes in or gets excluded, how does it affect the case? Well, we can do a controlled study where half the jury sees that piece of evidence and half doesn't, don't change anything else, and quantify what it does. Does it change our chance of winning? Does it change value? And so I got fascinated by big data when I was a law professor and I was publishing in the area of jury research. And we were looking at how to build a better mousetrap. How do we research people better than using grad students or law students or getting them off Craigslist? What became apparent was the same tools we were using in the academy could be used on individual cases. And so that's what we started doing. Big data kind of caught fire and people like Sean Claggett were early adopters, really brought in data as into part of his practice. Today, Sean and I do data on every one of his cases. I do big data with my wife, Alicia, who's also a lawyer, and we work with lawyers all over the country. Understanding what jurors will do with your evidence, how they're responding to your case, what's working, what's failing, is essential. And we've always known that, right? So we've always known we should workshop our cases or we do focus groups. The problem was there were real limitations to the model, right? You, you get eight people in a room, sometimes your friends and family, or they know that you're sponsoring it as the plaintiff's lawyer. And I think there's reasons to be doubtful how good that feedback is. What's really exciting now is if you put your case on and you present it in a way that jurors online are seeing some text, some images, some video, they're seeing the case but boiled down. And you know what 400 people think of your case, there's not much mystery left. You know if your client's credible. You know if the evidence is working. You know how likely you are to win. You know that if you ask for a certain amount of money, it works better than if you go too high or too low. You can test those things. And so what we view it as is, look, good lawyers are great with good information, right? So the more they know, the more they can make informed decisions. I was presenting with Sean Claggett yesterday about this, and we put up a chart. We had shown the plaintiff's video and asked jurors if they found him credible. 55% of the jurors said no. And when they said that, they only voted for the plaintiff 20% of the time. Well, you don't have to be a genius to figure out what to do, right? You got a problem with your client. Now, you can either coach him, hide him, or you might need to settle that case. But once you have good data, the decisions become easier. If you then arm those lawyers with really good information about their cases, they will get amazing results. Big data, you know, it used to be that lawyers said you can't know the value, right? You can't learn that from a focus group. When people say the numbers, don't listen. Well, they were right that with 10 people, you shouldn't listen. 
But the truth is that you can know the number. We track our predictions from big data versus the actual verdicts. It's, there's no guesswork, right? You can look and say over the last 50 trials, how did we do? We predicted a value, how did we do? Well, what we know is we're often within 5% of the verdict. Like Sean Claggett was talking about this. He had a verdict where against a trash truck company, our data said it would be 37.99 million. That's pretty specific. The verdict was 38.8, .8, right? I mean, we were off by $800,000. Um, we had a verdict in, in the middle of COVID in Pennsylvania, in a rural county that had never given more than $100,000. And we told the lawyer, your case is worth $10.8 million. And he thought we were nuts. Uh, he was like, man, they've never had a verdict like that. He tried the case, the jury awarded $10.8 million, right? So we can get very close with data to what a case is worth. And there's great power in that because look, if they offer you less than what the case is worth, you should say no, <laughs> it's not hard. And if they offer you more, you should probably say yes. So the first phase of the process for big data is to meet with the lawyers and start to understand their case, right? Because every study is tailored. You've got to build your studies to that case. And the great thing is, because I'm a lawyer and my wife Alicia is a lawyer, you know, what we like to do is talk with the lawyers, start to get a feel for what's this case about? And most importantly, what's keeping you up at night? What are you worried about? What's scaring you? What do you not know, but you feel like you should know? What is the defense saying? All those sorts of things, because then we can build out a study that gets at those things. Once you got hundreds of people looking at the case, voting on liability, you can ask questions about how do you see this piece of evidence? Everybody who votes for the defense, you can route them to a screen that says, here's the things the defense argued, rank them. And there's no mystery after that. The next step in a big data study is that we have to build what you call in technical terms, the stimuli, right? Which is the case presentation. The case presentation is the key to good data because Plaintiff's attorneys will come to us and they wanna put on their case and they have depot cuts and exhibits and animations and illustrations. And you say, all right, we gotta put on the defense case too. Oh, well, here's a page of words. That's bad data. And so the, the next step has to be to build a presentation that is true to the case and is truly fair to the other side because then you can trust the data when you're done. So the presentation that jurors see in a big data study is best thought of when you're crafting it as a lawyer is almost like a mediation statement, but for jurors. So you're spelling out, what's this case about? What background do you need? What do I need to educate you about to understand this case? Why do I win? Boiling in your evidence, baking it in. What are the damages? Now, what does that look like to a juror who's taking the study? Well, they're reading some, they're looking at diagrams, they're looking at pictures, they're looking at images of any kind. They're watching video cuts that could be depot clips, they could be dash cam footage, they could be animations, right? And the goal is to build something that's interactive uh, and engaging. We're taking the trial and distilling it. We have to distill it, but we wanna be true to it. So we wanna make sure we're hitting the big things we believe we'll do. I think what I spend a lot of time doing every day is working with lawyers to say, tell me everything the defense has ever said in the hallway, in a brief, in a summary judgment, in mediation, because we need to, if anything, put on a better defense than they will. And if we do that, we can be ready then to understand the case. So there's always a balance in deciding how much of the defense you put in, how much of your case you put in. So let's say, for example, that the defense really wants to get in that your client has passed drug use and you think it's 50-50, you'll keep it out. You'll exclude it on a motion. All right, well, look, we have to make some decisions. One might be you say, oh, look, I know this judge. I know we win this motion. All right, well, let's keep that out because we need to be true to the case. But what if you say to me, man, we could win or to lose it. Right? We could have, well, that evidence could come in against my client or not, and I don't know yet. Let me paint a picture of what a jury would see when they're taking one of these studies. Jury A sees it with the evidence in, jury B sees it with the evidence out. We're prepared for both scenarios, and we know if it matters, because you know what happens sometimes? A lawyer comes to me and says, oh, if they get this drug use in from my client, we're, we're done, right? We study it with and without it, we find out it doesn't make a lick of difference. I say, you can sleep at night, don't worry about it. If you lose the motion, who cares? First thing is, how do you get these people? Well, these days there's millions of people that are looking to do things online. And what we like is we like to recruit from platforms where they're not looking to be a juror, right? They're looking to do whatever. And they got an hour to spend and they think this is better than Sudoku. I'll make a little money reading the first chapter of a book or rating haircuts or doing a marketing study. And they see something that says you could be a juror. And some of them will come in. 
There's a lot of tools to sort of decide who comes in, to sample venues, to be specific to the area where the case is. But once they come in, what do they see? Well, they're on the screen. So they're gonna sign a non-disclosure. They're gonna agree to keep things confidential. They're gonna get some rules, make sure the headphones work, stuff like that. But then they're gonna start answering questions about themselves, just like Vordir because we wanna gather information about them, both so that we can later analyze, are they good and bad jurors by demographics or life experience, but also because we're gonna use that as an attention check. So for example, we're asking you, how do you vote and do you own a gun and what do you watch on TV and all sorts of things. And then later in the study, we can ask you those same questions again. If your answers don't match, then you were either in a hurry or being dishonest. Either way, we can't use you and you're out of the study. If you were being careful and you went through the questions and you sometimes if it said pick the third answer, you did because you were really reading, then you move on to the case. When you see the case, it's almost like you're on your favorite website, highly interactive. You're reading some, then you're clicking on diagrams, then you're watching video. Now, you have to maintain the integrity of the data by making sure these jurors are really doing the work. So for example, you show them a three minute video that has to do with an injured person getting in and out of bed to show how tough it is that they're hurt now and to help them understand the injury. Later, you ask a question like, how did he get out of bed? Did his wife help him? Was there a lift that lifted him out? Did he do it on his own? Anybody who actually watched the video gets that question right. If you get it wrong, you need to go, right? Because you're not paying attention to the case. And so what we get at the end is we have jurors who have been being careful, being honest about themselves, paid attention to the case, and now they're ready to vote, tell us why they did what they did. The next step after jurors have done their work, and you've recruited, depending on your statistical needs, anywhere from 200 to 1,000 jurors, right? And that, that depends on how many things you're trying to understand and how many things you're manipulating in and out. You need more jurors, the more things you do. But what you've got is a good problem. And the good problem is you've got a ton of data, all right? So the first thing you gotta do and I, I learned this doing publishing in the academic world is you have to be really careful to clean that data. Let me just give you one example. Say you ask somebody, how much do you award in damages? And they put down 10 million. Well, on a keyboard, it's easy to add a zero and put a hundred million. How do you know if they meant 10 or a hundred? And by the way, if you put in a hundred million when it was supposed to be 10, cause they had an extra zero, you just messed up all your numbers. So what do you do? you ask them to write in letters what they meant to award just below the number and you make sure they match. Now we've developed code for that that'll say, does it say 10 million and 10 million? If it doesn't, can we rectify that? Or did they write 5 million and, and type out 20 million? Throw it out, right? You have to handle data with care because ultimately you're gonna give lawyers this data to make decisions with. So the next step on our side is cleaning data, making sure we've got that data, packaged in a way that then we can play with it and use it. And we're lucky because we have a team of three PhDs who are all professors who teach jury behavior and they do all our backend statistics. And so that lets us make sure that we um, are doing everything we can with the data we have. When you get done cleaning your data, you've got this nice pile of data. And boy, I, you know, I'm a nerd, that excites me. Got all kinds of data, but now you gotta do the analysis. And so we've spent a lot of time building tools to understand how do we dig into that. So for example, you have what your win rate is, which is the percentage of jurors that voted for the plaintiff on at least one claim. You have your damage awards that you can break out into the average, the quartiles, the middle. You have fault. But what does that mean for the case value? Well, we've developed, for example, an algorithm that based on behavioral science and looking at past verdicts that we've predicted, weights, defense jurors, deliberation, and all that data to produce a, not only an average case expected value, but the likely extremes of that. So that an attorney can then say, on my bad day, the case is worth, on my great day, the case is worth, and on an average day, it's worth. And my likelihood of winning is eight and 10, six and 10, 10 out of 10, this is a dead bang winner. And then they can make decisions on advising their client, responding to settlement, or even sharing that information with a mediator to say, hey, if you wanna get this case done, I want you to know I've got 400 people that have actually looked at it and I've got a real sense of what it's worth. And oh, by the way, I can even tell you what different groups of jurors do because then we will analyze that data. So for example, we were working on an excessive force case in Fort Worth and we knew that the city of Fort Worth would say, yes, but we're gonna have a very conservative Trump type, back the blue uh, type jury. 
So what did we do? Well, we sampled broadly, but then we looked at just those types of jurors and could quantify the win rate and damages among them. And we said, great, if you wanna to pay today what that jury's worth, we'll go home. But if you don't, that's your best day, and we know that number. And if you won't pay it, cool, then we should try the case. Big data began as a way for attorneys to understand their case, but what we're seeing is it's becoming a tool to help resolve cases at mediation. Indeed, we're even getting calls from mediators that are starting to say, will you talk me through this report? And I, I spend a day every week, it seems now, talking to a mediator about how we study the case and why the data is reliable and showing them past results so that they understand this isn't made up, right? That this has predictive power and that we don't need to guess so much anymore about what cases are worth. I'll tell you something else that's blowing my mind. We've had a couple cases recently where when the mediator saw the data and shared some of it with the other side in a limited way, the case settled almost immediately. And I think I know what happened because at least one mediator sort of let me know. The other side had done data too and the numbers matched. And when the defense says, we know what our exposure is. And the plaintiff says, we know what we have. And those numbers are very close. Reasonable minds will settle that case. So assume the case doesn't settle at mediation. What do we do next? Well, the great thing is the same report that we could have used for mediation gives us everything we need to get ready for trial. So let me just give you a couple of examples. You have in that report, how many people are voting for your case and how many people are voting against you? Well, let's take the voting against you, the defense jurors. We can go look and say, what issues are defense jurors ranking as most important to support their verdict? Well, all right, we can start dealing with those, right? Because we're smart lawyers, we got tools. All right, great, we know we're losing on two issues. Let's deal with those issues. We also asked jurors to tell us in their own words, you voted for the defense. What would the plaintiff have to do to change your mind? That's the wish list, right? That's what they need to hear to get over the hump. All right, well, we're gonna go back to our evidence and see what we've got. We're gonna to talk to our experts and see, oh, we should have focused on that. We can talk about that. We're gonna use artificial intelligence to mine those comments from those jurors and get to the core of them so that we can look at some of the common themes and deal with them, right? So the lawyers got ideas about how to frame the case, refine the case on content. And then we've got another weapon, which is you have an analysis, a statistical analysis of which jurors deviate from the mean, meaning, which jurors are statistically better for you and which jurors are statistically worse. So what if we find out that in a case, um, education is highly predictive of how people will vote at a statistically significant level, people who have a college degree or above, let's say they are 25% less valuable for the case. Well, in jury selection, we're gonna score that, right? And as we talk to the jurors, we're gonna have a score sheet built of our predictors and we are gonna keep the highest value jurors and we're gonna to work to kick the lowest value jurors, right? And so after we've improved the case and refined the case and gotten ready for trial, then we're gonna figure out how we get our last advantage for our client, the last thing we can do to help them in the fight, which is to make sure we pick the optimal jury. After you've used the data for a jury trial, you're mostly done, right? I mean, that's the goal, is to understand our case, resolve it if we should, try it if we should, and try the best case we can. But we have started to see something interesting, which is we had a case in which an attorney got a massive verdict. We did not predict it, he, did, he beat our numbers. And he went up on appeal. Well, the case was at risk. And the defendant, of course, wanted to negotiate and settle the case on appeal for a discount. Well, the case expected value helped guide that to some degree because we knew that although we'd had an especially good day this time, if we had to retry it, it was unlikely to repeat. And we knew what a fair value for the case was. And so that, that data still informed that discussion even after a verdict and on appeal. Let me identify a couple of challenges to getting good data, and then maybe I'll expand that only to say to implement that. Uh, so on the getting good data side, it really comes down to how good is the presentation that you're gonna show jurors and then how good are you at asking honest surveys, questions, and cleaning that data? We've gotten really good at that, and we're lucky that we've got people whose entire careers as professors deal with building validated studies, handling data carefully. And so we, we take pride in the fact that we do that as rigorously as if you were publishing in a peer-reviewed journal, right? And in fact, I continue to publish in peer-reviewed journals, and we use the same statistical standards when we're working for attorneys on their own case. So I'm proud of that. But one of the challenges is that presentation that you're gonna show jurors has to be the case. 
and you're working with busy attorneys, right? And so when you say, no, I need you to drill down in the expert reports again. I need to be able to show the jurors the intersection and this photo doesn't work. I need to know the defense case, which is sometimes like pulling teeth to make, the, make an attorney tell you the other side's case truly and fully. That's always a challenge. And we've had times where in a rush, I think the presentation itself did not fully capture the case. And then you have to look at the data with a little more caution, right? And, and I always, I'm a big believer that the only thing worse than no data is bad data, right? If you, if you, if you give somebody data that's misleading, they make decisions based on it. So that's a challenge. The other challenge, I think, and we're learning this more and more, and Sean Claggett and Alicia and I talk about it a lot, and actually we've got a book coming out about this, is you can have all the data in the world, but you have to implement it. And so you say to an attorney, hey, you shouldn't be focusing on that individual truck driver. You should be talking about the company because jurors are much more upset at the trucking company than the individual driver who they feel a little sorry for. Well, okay, that's easy to say and the data makes it clear, but you've been talking about the case a certain way for three years. So what do you do? So one of the things we're learning that we need to do better is we need to help attorneys practice doing the things the data suggests. And so we've started more and more to send them out to Sean and say, hey, get in front of a live studio audience, right? And actually practice picking that jury. Actually practice giving that opening that way, right? Muscle memory. We, yesterday, Sean and I were presenting about this and it said, you know, it kind of be like if you watched a video of Michael Jordan and saw him do a great layup and go, all right, cool, I can do a layup now. No, you gotta go practice, right? You can understand the science, now you need to do the thing. And so big data is very useful, but only when lawyers then can use it in court. If I'm talking to somebody at a bus stop or at a restaurant, and I'm telling them what big data is for lawyers in a, in a few sentences, I would say that big data for lawyers is bringing a little bit of what is happening in the Silicon Valley and in the tech world into the law, right? So the law has always been the art and science of being a lawyer, but we've never really looked at the science. Big data is how we get the information that lets a good lawyer try a great case.